I'm just going to start. So the first question you might ask is, as Java programmers, why should you care about JavaScript interop? Um, if you're like me, you probably try to avoid JSNI and calling into JavaScript libraries as much as possible. You usually scour the net, and if you're looking for a library, you hope someone's already written it in Java, so you don't have to worry about messing around with JavaScript libraries. Um, and when Git started in 2006, the JavaScript community was quite small. People didn't even believe you could write large JavaScript applications. If you remember how the web was in the old days, when people thought of JavaScript, they thought of form validation. Like, I'll use this to check if something's a phone number or something. No one ever thought that one day people would be writing spreadsheets and word processors in JavaScript or that things like Gmail or Google Maps would exist. Um, those really didn't kind of start in f for a few years later. But things have changed since then. Now it's 2014, and the JavaScript community is much larger and much richer. So many of the, the old issues that were surrounding um, the JavaScript development experience, a lot of them have been rectified. People have come up with patterns and workarounds for it. And the JavaScript community has grown quite large. I mean, you know about AngularJS. There's many, many, many other frameworks besides Angular that are popular. Um, there's just a lot of value out there now in the JavaScript community that should be easy for you to take advantage of. Whereas before, you might have looked and you might not have seen anything that was even worth using. Now there's a lot of stuff out there that you kind of wish you could use to save your work. Like, for example, if you want to make really nice mobile widgets, you look at something like Polymer, and you're like, really, I really wish I could use those material design widgets that come with Polymer, but they're kind of hard to consume with Gwit. And so your choice would be to either look at the JavaScript code and rewrite everything from scratch in Java, or figure out a way to wrap it. And we don't want you to do either of those things. So, as I said, JavaScript, Gwit already integrates with JavaScript today. We know that. You can write overlay types. You can write JSNI methods. But it's kind of a pain. There's a, there's, there's this, a, lot of it, a lot of it, you look at it, and it looks like you could just auto-generate it. And you're thinking to yourself, why do I have to write this method that just looks like it could be automated? So we should be able to make this a lot better with GWT. Um, we should be able to reduce the amount of boilerplate that's needed. And we call that JS interop. And what JS interop is is the ability to use any JavaScript API, whether it's part of the browser, whether it's in some third-party JavaScript library, from Java with as little to no boilerplate code as possible, as well as the ability for you to write some code in Java, which can be consumed by other JavaScript libraries or other JavaScript developers. To give an example of that, let's take one of the oldies but goodies, jQuery. Everyone's probably familiar with this. And here's how you would do it in a new JS interop system. You declare an interface that kind of represents in Java this external JavaScript library called jQuery. And you'd annotate it with the Java annotation at JS type. And that basically instructs the compiler and tells it that the implementation for this thing might be defined in some external world that is not visible to the compiler. It's not, we're not feeding the J, J, jQuery JavaScript into the GUID compiler, so it's, it's invisible to the GUID compiler, but we're telling it that whatever this Java interface represents, it's something that's foreign. And so step two is, is we add a couple of methods there that models the, method call, the methods that are in the jQuery library. So typically, they're, um, the methods in jQuery return the jQuery object itself so you can chain them together. And jQuery tends to represent a collection of nodes that match to some selector um, to which these methods calls will apply to everything that matches. And so um, the first method is CSS. It says apply this CSS property with this value to everything that you match with some selector. The second one is a modification of the attributes on the elements that were matched. And the third is basically adding a click listener to every element that was matched. And so that's basically all you'd have to do to, to integrate with jQuery using the JS interrupt system. Then you just need to get an instance of one of these jQuery objects. And so there's a new um, sort of magic function that um, we're toying around with called JS. And in it, I'm just going to put a JS expression. There is a dollar sign UL greater than LI. And so this kind of acts like an eval statement. You can think of it as evaling that expression. But being GWT, we don't actually like runtime eval. So that's actually statically parsed and optimized um, at uh, compile time. And so then once we have an instance of that interface, the J object, we can just proceed to call those methods, j.css.attr.click. And you'll notice is nowhere did you write 
a JavaScript overlay object with a native method on it. You didn't write any JSMI code at all. You basically just declared the signature that existed in the JavaScript library, and the compiler just lets you call into it um, without knowing anything about um, the underlying implementation. So that's, that's in the direction of Java to JavaScript. But the reverse direction is also important. And in that case, the JS type annotation is a two-way street. It's basically a contract that says to the compiler that um, this underlying object must implement these methods that are in the interface. But it also says that if you have a Java implementer, those methods will be exported to JavaScript, and it will keep that interface and those names. And so what it allows you to do is take any Java type and export it to JavaScript. So if you have some JavaScript ninjas in your company, and you've written a big JavaScript Java library, you can export it to them, and they can use it in their own code as well. Here's an example. We have an interface called foo. We have a method one called my method, and you annotate it with at JS type. And then we make an implementation. Class foo impl implements foo, and I have an implementation of it, it just returns 42. And finally, we use that magic JS method I have again, and I call some JS method. Doesn't matter where it's defined, where it came from, some third party library. And I pass in a new foo impl as the first argument to that function. So I've passed a Java object compiled to JS into some third party JavaScript library. And the actual function implementation might look like that. It just calls foo.my method. Now, in the past, this would totally break you. There's no way this would work in the past because the GWT compiler would obfuscate that method name. It would no longer be called my method after compilation. It would be called like A, B, or X or something. And so what this does is the, the at JS type annotation tells the compiler for the methods in this interface, do not rename them, including implementations in Java. Don't rename them so that when you pass this outside of the GWT application to other consumers, the method names will keep their original names. And it doesn't just apply to um, methods. You can also do it with properties. And so if you have an external JavaScript object where it doesn't necessarily have properties, um, methods on it, it actually has fields, um, you can represent those fields in an interface as methods that return the value, and you put an at JS property annotation on them. So we all know that HTML element has a width field on it and a height field. And typically in JavaScript, you would do like element.width or element.height. Here we model it in the HTML element interface as a method call called with that returns a string. And for example, dot the CSS class name property, um, it returns a string. And if you annotate them with JS property, when the compiler compiles calls to the with method, it actually will leave off the parenthesis. And it will essentially just leave it as a dot dotted field accessor. So although it looks like a method call in Java code, if you were to do HTML element dot with open close parenthesis, it really just outputs element dot with instead. So it allows you to model fields um, in the same mechanism. And so um, it also works in reverse. So you might have, a, you might have an implementation of a uh, JS type where you have an at JS property on a method. And this is where it kind of gets really magical. So we've declared a Java class, and it has a method on it. But when the JavaScript programmer sees this object, when you pass it into a JavaScript library, it actually shows up as a field. So someone would say, you know, x.hello, and they don't put the parentheses on it to invoke it. But it actually does invoke the method, and it will return hello in this circumstance. So we're mapping a field to a method call. So that, that gives you actually some, uh, quite a lot of power because you, you're essentially, um, can, you can actually make the JavaScript API look very idiomatic to a, Java, uh, to a JavaScript programmer, but it's really behind the scenes doing a lot of stuff that we typically would do with setters and getters and being oriented programming. So one problem is, is that JS type only deals with static, um, non-static code, so it deals with virtual methods. It doesn't deal with static fields, static methods, constructors, and things like that. Um, and it doesn't prevent the compiler from pruning anything. So here's, the, here's a really important point. Just because you put at JS type on a class doesn't mean some JavaScript programmer can, can refer to that object, because the compiler will still prune it as, as if it was dead code unless it sees a new statement that instantiates an implementation somewhere. So in other words, um, 
the JS type tells the compiler not to rename the methods, but it doesn't tell them not to delete them. It still has to see somewhere in your Java code, you instantiate the object and pass it into JavaScript somehow. And it also, as I said, it doesn't deal with uh, static methods, fields, enums, and constructors, things that are not um, uh, virtual. That's where at JS export and at JS namespace come in. So as an example, here's a class called foo, and uh, we have a constructor on it called foo. And we want to export that to JavaScript so someone in JavaScript can say new foo. Now as I just mentioned, if there's no Java code that does a new foo, the compiler will delete it because it doesn't think there's any usage of it. But if you put the at JS export annotation on the constructor, the compiler says, oh well, somebody external to my application might actually call that method. Might, they might call that constructor. So now the compiler will not delete this class because it's going to say, I need to make that foo um, referenceable by some other external code that I don't see later. And so what ha will happen is, is when you put this at JS export on the, foo the constructor, it will be accessible as um, in a namespace. And so you have to basically tell the compiler where you want that foo symbol to live. Um, so what you do is you put an at JS namespace declaration on the class. If you leave it off, the namespace will be default to the same name as the package is declared in. So if your application is like com.acme.app, then the namespace will default to com.acme.app.foo. But JavaScript programmers typically don't deal with like complex nested um, namespaces like that. They like relatively flat namespaces. And so if you were making a class that you were going to export to some other JavaScript developers on your team, you typically want to give it a shorter name that's easier to reference. So here, I will give this, names, this class a namespace of my lib, and then I will give the constructor a, a, an external export. And so now it will be accessible to someone as mylib.foo. So in, in raw JavaScript code, someone consuming this could just say new mylib.foo, if that uh, makes any sense. And likewise, if you have a static final field on your class, like here's a public static final int called constant. If you put an at JS export on it, it just refer, you can just refer to it in JavaScript as mylib.foo, which is the name of the class, dot the constant. And so you see the constant actually lives under the name of the constructor in this case. But sometimes you don't even want that. So you can actually move the, um, you, you can actually rename that constant. So here, if there's the first parameter of the annotation at JS export is a, a, an alternative name you can give it. So here it would be available as mylib.foo.meaning of life. Um, but sometimes that's not even what you want because it still lives under the foo class. Maybe you want it to be hoisted up. So you can take that JS namespace at, um, annotation and you can move it down to the actual static field itself. And so here now it's just directly available as mylib.meaning of life. And so um, that might seem like a big deal to you, but sometimes JavaScript programmers like the libraries to look um, according to regular JavaScript idiomatic style, and that's usually that the static constant variables are on the top level of module namespace. Um, if you have a lot of classes, you don't necessarily want to put these JS namespaces everywhere, and so one thing you can do is you can declare a package-info.java file in the same directory as all your other Java source, and you just put the at JS namespace there. And what that does is it makes all of the other Java files in that entire directory inherit that namespace. Um, so in this case, I've put the mylib on this package info.java file, and then inside my actual foo class, I don't have to have the at JS namespace. It will just inherit the directory level JS namespace. Um, you can actually put the at JS export statement on the, the class itself. You don't have to put it on the field level, in which case it automatically, it's a syntactic sugar for automatically exporting every public static field or member of the class. But sometimes you have a class that has a lot of things on it, and you want to export most of them, but then exclude one. So here I have an at JS export on the whole class, but then I want to exclude the accept Europa field. So that one would not be available to JavaScript. Now, all of this would really be for naught if we didn't have Lambda conversions, and this is why Java 8 is important. If you do any programming against any external JavaScript library, you're going to need to pass functions. Um, and I don't mean anonymous inner classes, I mean JS functions. And so for example, I might have a Java interface called callback, 
and uh, you, you want to pass it to something like a click listener, or you want to pass it to some other external JavaScript function, it takes an asynchronous callback, and then you want this invo invoked. Well, the JavaScript libraries usually take functions, not Java anonymous inner classes. And so we need a way to automatically convert. If, we don't, if I don't want you to write any boilerplate, I, I need to automatically convert a Java interface to a raw JS function. And so that's done via this JS function annotation. And what this does is it opts this interface into what we call lambda conversion. And what that means is that any interface, any Java interface, it's a single method interface. It means it only has one method. Those are like runnable, callable. In Java 8, you have things like unary function, binary function, and so on, consumer and supplier. Um, any single method interface is eligible to be converted to a, jo a raw JavaScript function automatically. And the way this would work is you'd basically have something like, so let's say, the event target interface, which most DOM elements implement. And they usually have a method one called add event listener. And the first parameter is the string name of the event. The second one's a callback to call. And so if we just say that this callback interface is an at JS function, then when the compiler actually compiles this to JavaScript and it passes that it passes, let's say, one of your anonymous center class implementations of this callback, or let's say a Java 8 Lambda, it will automatically convert it to a raw JS function. And so here I've kind of given an example of what the compiler might do. It says like to JS function and it passes in the callback and it somehow magically converts it into a raw function. What the compiler actually does is a little more sophisticated. You don't really need to know what it's doing, but it basically um, turns um, lambdas and anonymous center class implementations into JavaScript functions on the fly without you having to do anything. There is one restriction, though. One thing that's really important is referential integrity. That means when the compiler does this, when it takes one of your interfaces and generates a JavaScript function that when it's called, calls your interface method, it has to ensure that the next time that same interface is converted to a JavaScript function, it's the same JavaScript function. It doesn't make a new one every time. And the reason that's important is, for example, add event listener, the way you remove an event listener is you call x.remove event listener and you pass in the callback. And so if every time this function here were called, it returned a different like, function wrapper around this, then when you tried to call remove event listener and you passed in this thing promoted to a function, you'd be passing in a different function and, and it wouldn't match up with the one that, that was there when you added it. And therefore, you'd have a leak. It would ne the two things wouldn't match up. So when, JavaScript, when Java interfaces are converted to functions and back, it has to be a one-to-one -one mapping. And because that's the case, there's a restriction, which is you want to take advantage of this automatic conversion into JavaScript functions. You can't have a Java class that implements two Java interfaces that both have a JS function annotation on it. Like, let's say you had a class called foo, and you implemented runnable and callable, and they both had a JS function annotation on them. When you pass this to JavaScript, it doesn't know which one should win, right? Should that function map to the callable interface or should it map to the runnable? It wouldn't have a one-to-one -one mapping between the type that it's trying to auto-convert and, 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 and how it would have to convert it back. So this is not a huge limitation, though, because in the vast majority of cases, um, People pass these things, these lambdas in, they only implement one interface. OK. So there's another thing that the interop system can do. You can actually subclass JavaScript objects, believe it or not. And so, uh, for example, let's say you had interface polymer button, and um, you wanted to actually subclass a button that was coded in the polymer library. So you've got a JavaScript constructor somewhere with field set up on a prototype, and you want to make a Java subtype whose parent class is something that's not even Java. Well, you can do it with this. What you do is, is inside the at JS type annotation, you have to give it a prototype attribute. You say that the prototype that I want to extend is some constructor function. You have to give it the name of the JavaScript con constructor function. And once you do that, a magic class is generated called polymer button underscore prototype. It's like an empty class. It doesn't have any implementation. But what it what it's allows you to do is subtype it. And so now I can actually say class my polymer button extends polymer button underscore prototype. And I can write a Java method that implements that interface, some method. And I can even call super that some method. 
And what, what does that do? Because the super type is what? It's, it's, it's like an empty subclass. Well, what the compiler really does is when it sees that super call there, it actually emits code that calls into the Polymer library's Polymer button uh, some method. It, so, it, so it really does work. It's kind of magical. Um, the compiler essentially says, um, well, the parent class in the Java source code says it's Polymer button underscore prototype, but really I know it to be this constructor function which you declared on the interface. So it, it replaces the super reference with a reference to like this JavaScript object that you're extending. So that's actually JS interrupt phase one. That's mostly what's available in GWT 2.7 behind an, an experimental flag called dash, AX, dash X JS interrupt mode. We don't really encourage people to use it because it's been undergoing constant revision. The so the question is, is um, why do we need to do anything more? What's wrong with what we currently have? After all, we did write Google Inbox using this. Well, there's a lot of restrictions that I haven't talked about. Um, we don't support overloading of method names. If you can think about it, when you, if you declare two methods with the same name and you try to export them to JavaScript, and the only thing that, that's different is the method signature, well, JavaScript doesn't have any concept of, overload, of overloaded methods, so how could one method, uh, how could two methods exist on a JavaScript object prototype with different argument lists? It doesn't work. And so that's one, that's one problem. We don't support var args. So if you have a Java method that takes object dot, dot, dot as one of the arguments, that doesn't work. Um, there's no clean way to invoke a constructor. So I showed you that it's done with interfaces. Well, you can't new an interface. And so we don't have a good solution for invoking JavaScript constructors. Um, there's no way to align the JRE collections with native JRE collections, like hash map doesn't map to a JavaScript map, and array list doesn't really act like a, jo a raw JavaScript array. For like, so for a JavaScript programmer, it's kind of problematic. You, return, you have a method that returns an array list, and he sees it and he thinks he can just index into it like it's a JavaScript array, but it's not. So that's another kind of pain point. Um, there's no easy way to define an object or an array literal. If you've done a lot of JavaScript programming, you know um, defining inline array literals or object literals, basically JSON, is um, really their bread and butter. And doing that in Java is way more verbose. So we don't have a solution for that. And we don't handle box types. So if you have an array list of integer, you hand that to a JavaScript programmer, he gets back an array-like thing that has something in it that's not numbers. You can't do math on it, um, so it's, it's kind of problematic. So I'm going to get to how we're going to fix that in a second, but I, I wanted to um, just briefly talk about um, Google Inbox. Uh, how many people know what Google Inbox is, by the way? OK, so it's like the rewrite of um, Gmail using GWT and J2Objective-C. Um, but really, we actually had to invent this JS interrupt stuff to make this work, because the way uh, it works is that it's a combination of GWT code and closure code, roughly 70% GWT code and 30% handwritten JavaScript code. And so if you have a team of like JavaScript ninjas who like eat and breathe JavaScript code and you have a team of Java programmers who some of them don't even know anything about JavaScript at all, you really need a way to make them, uh, their life easier for them to talk to one another without having to write a lot of boilerplate and stuff. So that's kind of where the genesis of this stuff came about. One of the things we do is we have the GWT compiler uh, for inbox output closure modules for the closure compiler. So one of the interesting things about that is, is we actually get cross-language type checking. So for example, if you have a Java class and you at JS export it, um, if someone in JavaScript calls a constructor and he passes the wrong number of arguments, he actually gets an error. So a JavaScript pro programmer gets a compile time error, if you can imagine that. Um, and he doesn't know anything about compilers. So, that's really, really valuable, and it saves our butt a plenty of times in, on the inbox team where some guy doesn't even know the Java API he's calling into, and he accidentally left off one of the arguments. So it's, um, it's pretty awesome. It's actually the same approach that Google Spreadsheets uses too, which is also one of these hybrid projects. So JS Interop really actually created a new category of app within Google, and um, also outside of Google, we've talked to people who are also pursuing a similar thing, which is, um, the ability to have a polyglot app, an app that's actually written in more than one language. And you could always do that with GWT, but 
uh, it was never quite a first-class citizen. It was always a little bit painful. And, and now it's been made a lot easier. But we need to take it to the next step. We need to make it make the impedance mismatch between the two languages so low that this is just second nature. And so now I'm going to talk about phase two. This is not going to be in um, WIT 2.8. This is going to be in WIT 3.0, which I mentioned in the keynote. So I mentioned um, Java 8 support. This is kind of core. JavaScript fundamentally passes functions around as first class citizens. And so um, it just needs to be there. So one thing about the new JS interrupt system is it requires Java 8 out of the box because we need lambdas and we need default methods to make it really uh, painless. And the reason why it's painless is this is like typical um, code. You might look at this and say, uh, is this Java or JavaScript? It turns out that like syntax-wise, that almost is almost identical to what it would look like in ECMAScript 6. Uh, ECMAScript 6 has arrow functions. Java 8 lambdas have arrow, arrow functions. It happens to be equals greater than instead of dash greater than and, and, and ECMAScript 6, but it's pretty much the same. So the syntax actually looks very much similar. Um, today, actually, JavaScript's more verbose. It uses a function, but ECMAScript 6 solves that. Um, but the other thing is, is we, uh, we need to introduce a terse syntax for um, evaluating small snippets of JavaScript. This is one of the syntaxes we're playing around with. Now, we would like to take the JS interrupt stuff so far that the situations in which you would need JSNY or need this JS magic JS function, which lets you inline a little bit of JavaScript, is almost reduced to zero. Like in other words, we want you to stay in Java almost 100% of the time. And if you have to write JSNY code, it's kind of like we failed. So this, this, allows, this is like the JSNY 2.0. This allows you to kind of like, for example, if I wanted to quickly evaluate um, a jQuery call, rather than saying public, static, native, void, evaluate something, and then inside there call into jQuery, you would just say JS square bracket and then like a little snippet of code. But um, we'd actually not like, to use, like you to use that um, that much, even though we're probably going to introduce it. But one thing that I'd like to say about this is that this actually is compile time parsing and optimizing. This is not an eval statement. Um, when you see this magic JS function for inline JavaScript, it actually is, is it's optimizing. It will obfuscate the stuff. It will prune dead code and everything. Um, terse array literals. And so just like you see back here, there's like this magic JS function. Then when it sees some inline JavaScript, it will actually insert it into the output. There's a couple of other magic functions that will be added. One of them is strings. And so if you say strings and you pass in a list of strings, the compiler will literally put down square bracket and then like the string arguments. And so this is like a really terse way to get a literal in Java. Likewise, I can do it with integers or I can do it with a heterogeneous. So the last example is like array, number, comma, string, comma, object. And that's basically the same as if in JavaScript you wrote square bracket and you just put the three values. Uh, another thing is to basically support var args. Uh, so for example, it, with the current JS interrupt system, it's impossible to, mod to model function dot call or function dot apply. So if you're familiar with JavaScript programming, there's a function object. So if you get a reference to a function object, you can invoke dot call on it and you pass in a var args, which is the arguments you want to pass to the function. It's, it's basically JavaScript's equivalent of Java lang reflect method invoke. Um, but there's no way to model it currently. And so we want to support this syntax, which is you could just say uh, object dot, 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 args. And so if you called this in Java, it would basically just put down function dot prototype dot call and then pass in the arguments. After stripping off the surrounding um, object array that Java does for var args. So Java models var args by constructing an array. So that has to be stripped away. Um, another example would be Canvas rendering context 2D, if anyone's ever used the browser uh, Canvas. There's a whole bunch of overloaded methods in there. Someone told me in the US presentation I got this wrong, thought I had it right, but I think draw image is what it is. But like, there's a whole bunch of draw image calls. The first argument is like an image element or a video tag or some other um, thing that has pixels in it. And then there's one variant of the method where you just give the destination on the screen and draw it, like X and Y. There's another variant where you give a source rectangle and the destination. And then there's another one that's a source rectangle and a destination rectangle, and it scales it. It's impossible to model that right now in JS interrupt. 
because we don't support overloading. But in the next generation, we are gonna support overloading. And how would we model constructors? And so this is how we're thinking about modeling constructors. Um, just to give an example, JavaScript has this um, um, system called typed arrays, where you can actually, it's like direct buffers in Java. You can create like an array of like 16-bit integers. Um, so you actually have, there are actually types in JavaScript now. And so normally what you do is you say new, in JavaScript you would say new int 16 array open parenthesis and its capacity, like how many elements to allocate it. So with the previous interrupt I showed you, that would be an interface in 16 array, but there'd be no way to declare a, a callable constructor. With the new technique, you could actually use a class, a concrete class instead of an interface, and you would put an actual method on it, like new instance, um, and then you could put an at JS constructor on it. And so now when you invoked uh, as a static method in 16 array dot new instance, like 20, the compiler will actually write out like new in 16, or it will actually change it to a new operator. So the at JS constructor annotation basically tells, teaches the compiler that this method call is actually a new operation. Um, so that's one way we do it. Another problem is, is that we can't model static methods in JavaScript. So for example, on the top level JavaScript root object object, there is a method called keys. And if you pass anything that's an object to it, it will give you a string array back, which is the, the fields that are on the object. And so there's no way currently to model that because JavaScript in, uh, Java interfaces can't model static methods like that. And so here's an example of how we would do it. We would say class JS object, and we put a public static native method on it so we don't have to declare its implementation. That's basically saying that there's a keys method that exists externally. And um, you have to specify the prototype because you have to tell the compiler where that lives. So now if you were to call JS object dot keys, you, the compiler would actually write out object.keys. And so, um, so the way we plan to model static methods is by native methods that exist on um, a, a concrete object. Okay, so that's some improvement to the JS interrupt system, but it doesn't go far enough. Let me give you an example. Today, this is how you consume Google Maps API in JavaScript. So there's a constructor function on the bottom where you knew google.maps.map, and you have to pass in an element of where to instantiate the map. Then you have to pass in this thing called map options. Now what is map options? It's basically an object literal with like fields on it, and it configures the map. So for example, here, here you're seeing it take zoom level eight, map type ID is roadmap with some enumeration, and then you, you give it a center, which is like a lat long object. So you can imagine, how would we do this with the JS interrupt system it is, as it is today? Well, we'd have a map options class uh, interface, and it would have an at JS type on it, and then it would have all these getters and setters on the thing that were annotated as JS properties because they're not methods, they're basically fields on the underlying object. And then to initialize it, we'd say something like JS object.create options that set zoom, options that set map type ID, options that set center with like a lat long object. And then we'd call map.create, which would call into the Google Maps library. But that's a lot of boilerplate. I mean, look at all the stuff you had to write just to create an object literal. Okay, so maybe we can go a little bit better. Maybe we can create something called at JS type literal equals true. So we, we give another parameter to this annotation and we have a concrete Java class and we tell the compiler this thing is really supposed to be compiled to just a raw object literal. So it's a Java class, but we're not gonna have any methods on it. We're not gonna have any virtual methods. We're not gonna have anything on it except like fields. So let's just treat it as like a, a, a dictionary. And so if we did that, then we could have code that looks like this. You just say uh, new map options, and then you would say uh, options.zoom equals eight, options.map type ID equals something, options.center, and so on. But even that's kind of a little bit of a boilerplate. Maybe we can go a little bit better than that. So um, you could use the initializer syntax in Java, which is like sort of the double curly brace pattern. And you could just initialize those fields inside there. So I could say double curly brace and make an anonymous inner class subtype of map options and say zoom equals eight, map type ID equals something, and so on. That's a little bit shorter. And the result you get is basically 
uh, out of that would be like an object literal over here, which is what we want. But even that's probably a little bit of boilerplate. Maybe we can go a little bit better. So let's create a helper abstract base class called at JS struct. Uh, sorry, called JS struct. It's an abstract class. We'll put this like special marker on it at JS type literal equals true. We're saying it's going to be an object literal. And then we create a subtype of it, an anonymous subtype of it, and we add three fields to it. So we're saying double zoom equals eight, int map type equals something, lat long equals something. And then we kind of do duck typing in a sense because we're creating a subtype of JS struct. So the re result of this new operation is, is basically something that's not a map options. So that would be a compile time error. So it's a subtype of this that's got three fields on it and it's gonna get compiled into that. But to make this assignment work, we have to add like a little bit of casting there. But the result is, um, it's pretty compact. So if this, is how you had to, if this is how you had to create object literals, it would be pretty compact. It's only a few extra characters compared to how you would do it in JavaScript, and you get like type checking, and you get command completion in your ID, and so on. And consider the effect that this would have just on something like an RPC mechanism. Um, you could make an incredibly light RPC mechanism to call, a to call a server with XHR using this. For example, imagine I had an XHR class and I had a static method on called post. The first argument was like a URL to post to. Then the second argument would be a JSON object and then the third argument would be a callback. And this is all you would have to do to pass like the equivalent of a JSON object literal that would have like customer name, Ray, speaker number, one, two, three, would be to do an anonymous interclass subtype of this thing, you declare two fields, and then you pass a lambda callback. That's pretty succinct to what you'd have to do today in GWT or in Java. Um, it's about as close as you could get. If you tried to write this in JavaScript, um, it's, it's not very um, much more succinct. This is pretty compact. But you also get type checking you get in your IDE, which is very nice. So, there's another problem when I mentioned earlier, which is when you're returning Java types back to JavaScript, especially collections classes, um, it is a mismatch between what JavaScript programmers expect to, to operate on and what Java programmers expect to operate on. So JavaScript developers really like their idiomatic collections and returning maps and lists to JavaScript programmers is not a good idea. So how could we fix that? Well, we can introduce a new annotation called at JS convert. And so what you could do is, is if you have a method that you've exported to JavaScript, and the JavaScript programmer is likely to just pass you in a raw JavaScript array, and you really expect the list, you could put this annotation on that API, which would teach the compiler to say, well, before you pass this list argument to the implementation method, please use this class to convert it so it'll upconvert a raw JavaScript list into a real array list. That's one way of doing it. Um, this is a more powerful way of doing it, which is you give the objects themselves, the types themselves, the responsibility for converting back and forth between the two representations. And so let's say you had an API that expected a map. And so a JavaScript programmer might pass in some raw um, JavaScript map using just basically an object literal in JavaScript. And so on your side, in the Java world, you're expecting to get a Java hash map or something that implements the map interface. And so what you'd want to do is you'd want to have the compiler automatically upgrade that, that, that object into a real hash, hash, well not a map, but into a real map. And then if you were to take that value and pass it back into JavaScript, you'd want it to convert it back. And so as the type bounces back and forth, you want it to kind of like upgrade and downgrade um, in a way. And so this is how you would do it. You would create, let's say, a class called string map that implements the map interface. So this is kind of like a wrapper for some kind of raw JavaScript map. Let's just call it JS string map. It's like an overlay type. And so you have to basically implement a constructor, and the constructor has to take the raw JavaScript type. And then the other part of the contract is you have to have a two JavaScript method that returns the raw JavaScript type. So when a type flows in from JavaScript and it's marked as JS aware, the compiler will insert a constructor call that upgrades it into some Java object. And then when this, whenever this object flows back into JavaScript, like you're calling 
uh, some JS type interface where you're passing it to a JavaScript library, it's going to invoke the to JavaScript method and unwrap it. And so um, the way that that is arranged is that there is a JS aware interface. So if you make your class implements JS aware, and in the type you put the the raw underlying JavaScript type that you're expecting to accept, the compiler will arrange that whenever it sees something that's a JS string map, it will upgrade it by calling the constructor. So what this would allow you to do is to return lists, maps, and, and sets to JavaScript, and they would, they, would, they would automatically have a two JavaScript method invoked on their implementations in order to, to downgrade them to some raw JavaScript type. And then once those are passed back into Java, they're automatically upgraded by calling the constructor and constructing these wrappers. Um, you have similar problems with referential integrity where you don't want to do it multiple times. You kind of want double equals to work. And so the implementation here is, is simplified for purposes of the presentation, but really what you'd have in here is you'd have, uh, you'd make this item potent. So if the constructor is called twice for the same underlying JavaScript object, you get back the same implementation uh, and vice versa. Um, you, you basically don't want to create multiple wrappers for the same underlying object. Okay, so I've given you the fundamentals, but it, this still seems like a lot of work, meaning like you, you, even then, do, do you really want to write all of this for all of the libraries that exist out there or all the browser APIs? You don't. You want this to come out of the box for you working already. The problem is, is that um, the APIs that you're likely to go against are going to change all the time. So if you were to manually write these wrappers or these JS types, you'd probably be out of sync in like six weeks, especially for the browser. Um, APIs. And so one of the things we're doing is um, the ele an Elemental 2.0 library. And this is um, effectively a rewrite of Elemental. So it's completely different than the earlier Elemental that was shipped in GWT 2.5. The reason why is, is what it does. What it does is it actually goes out and parses the real W3C spec documents, including the documentation, extracts these interfaces with the annotations that you're needed automatically, and adds documentation to them, including Java doc. So it's always up to date, and basically there's practically zero performance overhead because you're just, you're just representing the browser APIs as interfaces, so there's no wrappers, there's no um, Disney methods or anything. Um, so before I go on, let, let me see, I didn't do this in the US, but I have a little bit of extra time. So let me see if I can, yeah, so I'm not on my corporate network, so my my normal IntelliJ licensing server is not uh, active. So, but let me, let me see if I can show you really quick um, uh, using an evaluation version how this would work. And um, there we go. Uh, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna launch this thing and show you what the console is doing and hopefully that my network is good enough for it to actually do it. So you can see it's going out to all of these websites down the bottom. I don't know if you can see how effective you can see this. It's fetching these right now. These are all the spec documents for every single web API that exists up until the latest version of Chrome 41. So it's like the map element, microdata, um, interaction, what's it gonna hear? The history API of the browser, timers, navigation time and geolocation, um, animation, the video element, web crypto, which is a new API, web RTC. Now it's running out all the interfaces. So it extracted all of that from the documentation. And so for example, um, now like if I, for example, went to the window object, oh, first I got to uh, add those to my class path. Hold on for a second. Otherwise it, my ID won't see them. Okay, so now if I went to and looked up the window object, and looked at it, you can see it has all this nice little documentation from it. Like, this was all auto-generated. None of this was handwritten. And so, like, let's say um, you uh, wanted to use speed synthesis. How many of you have used a new speed synthesis API in the browsers? So you probably know nothing about it. But because we, um, we automatically extract this stuff, we now have the speed synthesis API as elemental-type interfaces. So if you don't know what the methods are, you can get completion. If you don't know what they do, you have documentation automatically generated for you. And so that's really cool. You don't actually even have to go read a W3C specs. 
Um, oh, thank you. And so the, the way this would actually work is, is like you, you would, um, let's say some new API was released in a browser and you wanted to use it, you would just rerun a build rule, like a Maven build rule. It would launch this, you'd build a new Elemental 2 jar with the latest browser APIs. You wouldn't have to wait for the GWT team to add it to the SDK. So you could always get the new APIs whenever you want it automatically. So let's, um, let's go back. Okay, so what I was gonna say about that is, is that Typically in the past, you know, people would say, you know, should I use GWT or should I use one of these other JavaScript libraries? And one thing I hope is from, from the start when I talked about how big the JavaScript community has got is that the either or question um, is kind of reduced in its importance and that we can really make it so easy to consume these external APIs um, or to have Java and JavaScript talk that um, you don't face as much internal fighting over these decisions as you used to. Like if somebody else in your company is using you know, one of these other JavaScript libraries, you can say, oh, well, no problem, I'll just export you an interface from my Java code and you can use my widgets in your app or vice versa, I'll just use yours. And it's just really easy to do it. The key is, is basically use whatever language you like, um, let your t other teammates use whatever language you like, don't force everybody to write everything in one language because that just leads to some animosity. <laughs> so use JS to interrupt instead. So that's, that's basically my presentation. If anyone has any questions, um, I think we have about um, six minutes, six or seven minutes.